G'day folks, thanks for joining us for another episode of the Snowy's Camping Show. Joined as usual by myself, Ben, and my colleague Lauren. I just hit the cord there. Sorry. Hey, if you haven't already done so, uh, please subscribe either via your favorite podcast app wherever you listen in, or you can watch us on YouTube and you can also join in on the conversation at the Snowy's Camping Show Facebook group where we'll be on there, all of our other community is on there, and we can answer questions from our res or aimed at our resident caravan expert, Kev, who joins us today. How are you, Kev? I'm fine. Thank you, Ben. How are you guys going? I'm all good. Yeah, we're pretty good. Yeah. We've had a bit of a dog of a day here at Snowy's, yeah, haven't we? Yeah, a few false starts. So, um, yeah, hopefully we, we get through this one all right. Hey, um, Kev has just come back, like literally like just, just. yesterday, rolled back from a trip up the Eden Data track. And I think it was a bit last minute, wasn't it? You called him in and said, can we – ask you about caravans. Well, yeah, he was floating track. around today and I was like, right, podcast tomorrow. And he was yeah. like, let's do it. Oh, he's yeah. keen. Yeah, good one. Mm. So we're, we're trying to – we're asking you today, not not so much a little bit about your trip because we are interested, but we, we want to answer a question a lot of people have around can I take a caravan on the Udna Data track and it, should I do it, should I do it, if I do what I need to consider. But before mm. we jump into that, what is or where is the Udna Data track? Give us a rundown on that, Kev. Well, the Unidata track starts at a small town called Maree, which is up in the, I suppose you call it the northeastern part of the state or central eastern part of the state. The, the state being South Australia? South, yes, South Australia. South Australia, yes. Yep. And it follows the old GAN line, the old original railway line that goes between or went between Adelaide and uh, Alice Springs. And that's mm. all, of course, being pulled up now. But uh, it was a road that follows it. follows it sometimes closely, sometimes it's quite a way for it. But it goes for about 617 kilometres. Uh, it's a dirt road and it ends up um, ends up finishing at a small town called Marla, which is on the Sturt Highway um, to south of the uh, uh, South Australian Northern Territory border. Right. Cool. Do you so, know how long it is, just out of interest, by any chance? 617 kilometres yeah. is what right. it is. There you really go. <laughs> and you did the whole lot, right, end to end, Marla to, Marla to Mari or Mari to Marla? Mari to Mala. Yes, yep. that's how long it is. That's how long the Uta Data track is. Yes. Okay. And best time of year to go. I mean, weather is all over the place nowadays, and I think you got caught out by the sounds of it, but when generally would people do the Uta Data track? A time of year? Uh, yeah, the best time would be in the cooler months. Um, obviously, it is the outback, and it can get very, very hot in summer. Uh, I think um, William Creek, which is on the track, was recording 47, 48 degrees Oof. last summer, um, whereas um, this time of the year, you're looking at about 20 or 20 or perhaps a little bit higher, a little bit lower. It does depend on the weather patterns, though. Uh, some, say, April through to September is probably the best. <coughs> Excuse me. But you do have to be aware that that's also the time when it's possibly going to rain up there too, and that's a big trouble with most outback roads all over the country. Is when you get a bit of rain on it, they can actually turn them into a very slippery, slidey mud track, which is not the best time. So uh, this time of the year is a good time to go. But yes, just be aware of the weather and what weather patterns are approaching it, and if there's any roads closed or not. Okay, we'll ask you a little bit more on your, your side trips and and the rain you encountered uh, after we've covered some of the other bits. But uh, I know I've been on it. Um, in the warmer months, and I guess if you do it in the warmer months, it's certainly, certainly doable, but take extra water. But um, I think what's going to make it impossible would be particularly wet weather. Uh, am I right in saying that? Yes, absolutely. The, um, in fact, earlier this year, the track was closed for, I think, about two weeks, two and a half weeks, and then only sections of it were opened a little bit at a time. Um, there's a website from the South Australian Main Roads Department or whatever they're called, uh, it's called uh, SA Outback Roads. If you Google that and put in the search, they'll um, come up with a map and it gives you all these roads in that area that with different colour codes. And uh, a different colour code tells you what's open, what's not open, if it's four-wheel drive only or four-wheel drive without towing um, or open to all vehicles, those sort of things. So it's quite handy to do. But that's the only thing to really be considering in the cooler months is what the weather's doing. Okay. I think you could probably call ahead to some of the roadhouses along the way too and they'll give you an idea of track conditions. I think they'd rather someone called ahead than got bogged and they'd have to try and Help someone in trouble? Mm. Yes. The Unidata uh, Roadhouse, the Pink Roadhouse, is very good. It's got a lot of information. You can email them or phone them directly and they'll give you up-to-date information on what the track's like. Yeah, okay. Beautiful. So a lot of, I guess, um, information online or, you know, you read through some chat forums and uh, tourism advice places and things like that probably suggest that taking a caravan on the Udna Data track is not a good idea. 
But you obviously, you know, caravanning with Kev, you're our caravan man. So you've obviously just um, done the track with it. And I know you've done it a couple of times beforehand as well, right? That's right. So um, what's your experience with doing the track with a van? If you're going to go on the track, uh, I would recommend an off-road van, Mm -hmm. mostly because they're sitting a bit higher. They tend to have better suspension and better tyres that are on them, whereas your conventional road caravan, they sit a bit lower, uh, suspension probably a little bit softer, a little bit um, more for smoother surfaces, uh, and the tyres are generally just a highway type of try. So the the problem with the track is that it can be quite... um, can be quite corrugated in places, can be a bit stony, can be quite dusty and dirty, whereas um, travelling on with a conventional caravan, it it will get a little bit of a rough ride. Um, You could still take one, but I would travel much slower. I wouldn't go much over, say, 60 kilometres an hour with one. Um, But even in saying that, even with a full off-road van, you shouldn't really go fast on dirt roads anyway. It's just common sense because if you start to slide with a van, if it starts to drift off into the soft edges, you know, you could have a big van sliding across the road, taking you with it, and simply because it can't grip on the dirt. Mm. So a conventional caravan, you could, but I would look at it very carefully as to actually what type of caravan. You look at some of these little retro vans you see buzzing around, uh, pulled by low slung cars, definitely a no-no. Okay. Uh, if your van had a bit of a, a bit of a height modification, they lift it up, you put better tyres on it, mm-hmm. you probably could, but just take it really easy. But once again, it depends on the conditions at the time. If they haven't graded it, it could be a bit corrugated. If they've graded it, it'd be nice, like a nice smooth highway. So it just depends on all sorts of circumstances, whether or not you take a road caravan on it. But an off-road caravan, I would say, yes, you should be able to. Okay. If you had, like, because I was thinking, you know, your road caravans, they come in a huge range of different shapes and sizes and lengths and weights and all that sort of jazz. I'm assuming you would have a much better time if you had something like a little Jayco pop top versus if you had, you know, a, an 18, 20 foot sort of proper full size caravan. Uh, or- yes, that would probably make a difference. No doubt about it. The smaller vans are easier to tow. Mm. Uh, the bigger vans are much hard, heavier to tow. And if you do happen to get into some soft material, the, the van will, the bigger van will bog much easier than a little one. It'd be a lot harder to get out. Yeah, right. Um, so a, a small van would probably be uh, ideal, be better. But uh, some people like their space. And I've seen tandem axle vans, as you say, up to probably 18, 20 foot long go along there. Okay. But if it's dry, it wouldn't be a problem. It's just if it gets a bit wet, yeah. Okay. So two things you mentioned there is tyres and suspension. Tyres is always, even if you're not towing caravan, is, is a big thing, like the right type of tyre, not a highway tyre, but a, 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 a heavy-duty or a light truck type tyre and tyre pressures are, the, are a, a major consideration both for your car and your caravan. What sort yes, of tyre? Yes, I I would recommend an all-terrain tyre Yep. if you're going to go along that sort of truck for car and caravan. Mm-hmm. Um, they're a lot squarer in construction. They don't bulge so much. So even if you reduce the tyre pressure, which is what you should do anyway, um, I went down to about 20 PSI, and the tyre doesn't bulge much. It, it still sort of sits on a bigger platform. It spreads its footprint a little bit more, but it's softer on the bumps and takes a little bit of a load off your um, suspension. Uh, and also it stops the bulging of the tyre because often a tyre, when you let it down, the sides will bulge out like a balloon. That means these sides are much thinner than the tread, so therefore they are much more susceptible to a sharp rock spiking through them and ripping the sidewall mm. because if that happens, it's the end of the tyre. Mm. Yeah, okay. And suspension is – people often think, oh, I'll just go slower because it's safer to drive slower, but there's also a consideration on the suspension and how hard the suspension system is working, particularly the shock absorbers. Yeah. I keep saying absorbers when I say absorber, I um, but they get hot, right? If you're going fast, those shock absorbers are going up and down really fast mm-hmm. and that creates a lot of heat and that's when you can lose a shock absorber. And if you've lost a shock absorber, it's never happened to me, but I believe it just becomes a very rough ride suddenly. Yeah, yeah. Well, the shock absorber controls the suspension, uh, how how it rebounds basically from being compressed to being um, expanded. Uh, and it's just called it keeps it under control. And as you're quite right, they can get very hot. Um, it still gets down to the fact that if you slow down and take it easy, you'll be fine. If you want to be like a rally driver, you can expect to have problems. I've seen this happen. I've been to this camp and bushway up in the thing once and people waiting for shockers all to be flown in because they were they were completely mm. destroyed. Yeah, they right. just wouldn't slow down. And one guy says, it's fine to drive along. You're in your car. It's nice and smooth. Uh, if you're going speeding over the corrugations, but he said, you don't know what's happening underneath. Mm-hmm. The suspension is going like crazy. It's going up and down, up and down, up and down like crazy. So you think you're all right, and then you get somewhere, and suddenly you see oil dripping down, and the, the shock absorbers had it. Yeah. So it still yeah. gets down. If you've got shock absorbers, yes, still slow down, take it easy. Yep. Yeah, that's really interesting because um, 
you know, a lot of places, especially if you're looking up things like, oh, Udna Data Track Advice and stuff, a lot of people would just like just fly along as fast as you can because it's the only way to like stay above the corrugations. Mm. And it's like I guess if you're somebody who's taking that as part and parcel without having a, a lot of knowledge around it as well and if you're towing a caravan, it's probably not really great advice at all. So, the, yeah, the forward dry shock absorbers are bigger so they kind of have more oil to move around so they can disperse that heat more. So it smooths it out and also just handles that movement mm. better. So, um, But not not all caravans, so we talked about road caravans before, they don't all have shock absorbers, I, I don't believe. Some of them are just leaf sprung. Um, That's correct, yeah. So some, sp- some caravans, particularly the road caravans, uh, simply have springs. There's no um, shock absorbers involved with them at all. Um, you can still drive on the road with those. It's just a matter, like I say, just keeping things under control. Um, otherwise, you start getting the van skipping along the uh, corrugations, and as you go around the corner, it starts to skip sideways. So it's just a matter of keeping things under control a little bit better. And your caravan has shock absorbers with an axle, is it? Mine does, yes, because it's built as an off-road. You find most off-road caravans will have uh, shock absorbers on them. Okay. Some of the highway caravans won't have um, shock absorbers because they just find they don't need it. Okay. And, and yours tandem? No, mine's a single axle. I got a single axle with a beam axle. And uh, the reason I built it that way is because of simplicity. If if I break an a independent suspension arm or something out in the bush, I figure it's a lot harder to get one of those replaced than getting another beam axle. Mm-hmm. The beam axle is basically welded all back together again, whereas independent suspension is a little bit harder. So I went with simplicity, but I had no problems. The van still can move around a little bit, but it's only a small van. It's only 3.6 metres long, so it's not such a big deal. So what would the benefit of independent suspension mean? Independent meaning that each wheel moves isn't attached by an axle from one side to the other. Yeah. The independent suspension allows one wheel to move up and down independently of, of every other axle that's on the van. If you have a beam axle like mine, uh, in some cases, if I hit a big bump with one side, the spring will compress and lengthen, which basically means that wheel will move backwards slightly. Now, because it's joined to the wheel on the other side, as the wheel moves backwards, it actually changes the direction of the wheel on the opposite side. So if I hit a big bump and the van bounces up in the air, suddenly the wheel on the other side will change direction slightly, just like you turn your steering wheel a little bit. And the van will sort of shoot off in a different direction for a moment, and then the wheel will land back on again, and it'll straighten up again. Because then it'll follow back again, and this can sometimes start swaying, um, an out of control sway with the, particularly the bigger van. So the beam axles aren't quite as as best on rough roads as the independent, but it does once again depend on the size of the van. And if you've got a tandem axle, beam axle it probably won't be such a big problem because you've got two wheels sort of keeping things in straight in line. But um, that's the advantage of the independent is having an independent wheel moving up and down without affecting the wheel on the other side at all. Okay. But doable with both, but shock absorbers are certainly going to make it uh, handle better. It will. It will definitely, yes, yes, okay. yes. Shock absorbers are a definite plus for any suspension. If you're someone who has a caravan that's, you know, maybe an older model, it has leaf sprung suspension, is it – would – can you get shock absorbers added or can you get that leaf sprung removed and get the suspension system changed or how does it work? Yes, you can. You could do anything you really want in that regard. It's depending on finding the appropriate person to do it. Um, they can remove the entire suspension system from your caravan and put a whole new one on and reinforce the chassis at the same time if you want to do that. Um, it's just a matter of just cutting all of the spring hangers off and then re-welding re- any steel or fittings would not need to be and welding the new one up there. If you want to put shock absorbers on your existing caravan, that's probably possible. We've just got to be careful of how um, much space you've got and where you can fit it because they've got to be fixed to fairly decent sort of mounting points. Mm. And also the, the compression length uh, and expansion length of the shock absorber has to be considered as to where it's positioned as well because some of them are only short. The ones I've got on mine are specifically for caravans. It's, only, mm. it's called an Alco shock absorber and they're only fairly little short things where if you compare it to something i've got on the back of the land rover it's it's twice as long in its own right and without it expanding it goes to you know almost one and a half times as length so that would be okay. rather impractical to put on the caravan yeah so, so it's just a matter of taking someone who knows what they're doing and they'll put something on that's appropriate and when you say know what they're doing it's it's an engineering feat right it's not just a case of welding some mounts on and would you, would you go like could, you'd have to- would you go to somewhere like pedders for example uh they could you, you could yeah, you could. Someone who deals with suspension um, or a caravan repairer who's obviously done that. Some caravan repairers will do engineering on your caravan. Um, some of them will just do like minor repairs to the actual caravan itself and service the mm. brakes and bearings. So you've got to have someone that has got the facilities and the know-how to weld up the appropriate suspension mm. uh, for what you want with your van. And as I said, in some cases, they've got to reinforce the chassis as well. 
Okay. Right. But the chassis is just too light for it. Yeah, they'll bend the chassis if you hit a big bump, even though you've got great suspension, the rest of the caravan will give up the ghost. Okay. So if you're buying a second-hand caravan and you want to put shock absorbers on it, just be aware probably of Probably not a cheap exercise, or I wouldn't have thought, exercise, by the time yeah. you're engineering and all the work in. Mm. So you mentioned stone guards before, but you don't have a stone guard on your actual van, do you? Or what no, have you? No. Um, it's something that I've been sort of always thinking, oh, well, Yes, for general use, I don't need it. Um, for the sort of roads that I go I on on a short trip, it's not a problem. But I should have really looked at doing it this time. I've been on the unit at a track with my van at least three or four times. And I've been up there about six times altogether. And I've often thought I need something better than what I've got. I've padded the front of the van. There's aluminium panels, uh, like thick aluminium panels on the bottom of the checker plate. And that's all very good. But um, things like the gas bottles and the draw bar and the... the uh, electrical fittings, you know, they've all got to be protected as well. And it, it, the, the draw bar looks like it's been sandblasted every time I come back simply because of the amount of stones that are hitting it. And even mm. though I've got big mud flaps on the car, stones still bounce around. They still go under the mud flaps uh, and they still hit the van. So, yes, protecting the front of the van is important. Um, the van is okay. It's not damaged. Mm. Um, but other things underneath the van, for example, your water tanks uh, and fittings, they've got to be protected as well. You can't just leave them because they'll get pummeled. Yeah. It's amazing when you get on the van afterwards and you see what's what's happened under there and all the paint's gone off, all the chassis rails, they're all shiny through the stones hitting and yeah. just like someone just, as they've gone under with a big fan blaster and just mm. blasted everything away. Oh, wow. So you've got checker plate under your van but you don't sort of have anything between your vehicle and your van per se? Uh, no, other than the big the van, the car's got mud flaps on it okay. uh, on all four wheels and that stops a lot down, stops a lot from going up. But um, I was more interested in protecting the van. So I've got checker plate on the bottom part of the front and mm-hmm. I've got padding on the front at the top, but there's still stones that have gone above it. Yep. So uh, they bounce and ricochet in all sorts of directions. So in reality, I should do something more um, permanent for it. There's, there's various things on the market that you can use uh, and buy and look into. But, uh, yeah, I, sh- I should really do something. If we're going to do this trip again, which we plan to at some stage, yes, mm. I'll definitely be putting something better on it. You did mention um, in some previous conversations we've had, I know that you had some dust issues with a, a trip that you did and that you thought that was relating to stone guards or a stone flap or, or something you had? Yes. Um, what I found was that um, the previous trip I did, I put mud flaps along the front of the caravan underneath to try and stop stones from hitting up uh, underneath. And we found it seemed to alter the airflow that goes under the van because when we stopped after a, a, the first day on a dusty road, we opened the door and there was just dust everywhere mm. that had come in through any of the little gaps you could find through the door gaps, all these sort of things. Because prior to that, we hardly ever had any gas uh, dust come in. And, of course, I took those mud flaps off and um, this trip hardly any dust went in the caravan again. So I'm sort of putting it down that they disrupted the airflow. Yep. They caused you know, eddies and different directions of dust and dirt that come off the car and it just caused it to be sucked inside the van. So something you've got to be considered. Um, people put big mud flaps on their cars and things like this, and they're all a good idea to stop the stones, but it does appear to change the airflow. And I've read about this on a couple of forums where um, the mechanics have said they've noticed some components getting very hot and even signs of overheating because the airflow has been disrupted. So just something that if you're going to do, have a look into it a little bit further and get some advice. Research. Does that yeah, apply for the, yeah. the big long mud? Because you said it was on your van. I've seen mud flaps that people have that go right across the back of a full drive as well, so they cover. Yeah. They're like a big hot, like volants, aren't they? Yeah, sort of thing across yeah, the back it's of the car. Iron Williams or something on it. So is a consideration like do that? Does that? I imagine that would change airflow as well. Does that also yeah. cause issues with heat if it's on the car, not just the van? Yeah. Yes, it will. It will. And I've also seen those things. Um, uh, the big things that go across the back, they sit just above the ground. Now, if you hit a, a, a bit of a dip, the, the, mud car, the mud flaps will drag on the ground, and the first thing that does is flick up stones. Uh-huh. So they're not always that practical. They, they can be, and they probably do stop a lot of stones, but yet there's all sorts of things to consideration. It's, it's not a, a straightforward, just whack this thing on, it'll fix it. it you've got to look right. into yeah. it a little bit. What about those big V-shaped kind of trampoline things that sit sort of above the draw bar? Um, I'm assuming that's... I'm, I'm not a caravan. I'm yeah, assuming do, that's for they, stone guards as well. They do sort well. of look like a bull bar that's been strung with a fishnet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah that's, a, that's a good one. Um, the, the trouble I've heard with those is that you've got to have them loose. Some people tighten the mesh very tight. Okay. Um, and that acts like a, a spring. So a rock will come <laughs> off the car, get that up, bounce back in the back of your, your car. car. <laughs> oh, wow. And I'll lose, you'll lose your back window. I've heard of many people losing their back window of their car through wow. stone. Yeah. So don't put, if you put them on, they're fine. 
but don't have them tight, have them loose so that the velocity of the stone is, is reduced. Down well, and bouncing off panels just basically fall to the ground. <laughs> thought about that. How good is that advice? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you just imagine you're driving yeah. along and like neck minute, your yeah. back window's just shattered. You think we're yeah. right. There's no yeah. dents on the caravan, but there's no back window anymore. Yeah, yeah. So. Free, yeah. free air conditioning. <laughs> um, oh. Other gear. Um, I haven't got any other questions, but uh, so things hanging off the side, um, I think you mentioned it before, like taps for water tanks and that sort of thing. Like how do you, I'm assuming the rocks just take anything out because and it's usually yep. the rocks flicking up from the car in front. So how do you protect like water taps and you, all your gas fittings and those sort of things? Yeah, they they should also be up as far as you can, up under the body of the van as you can. If you're really in doubt, try and get some um, rubber and put a rubber cover over it or some sort of um, something that'll protect them. Um, my brother-in-law was with us on the last trip, and within the first fifty k's of going on the track, he lost these water tank. They, they broke the outlet hose on it and snapped it off, so his tank just drains. Yeah, yeah right. Um, and even myself, I have a little drain that I keep replacing. I keep moving a different spot, and the rock steel keeps hitting it and breaks it off again and again. So I've got to do something much better with that. Uh, not that that was important, but um, it still worked. But uh, yeah, my brother-in-law, if that was the only water he had, he mm. he'd lost all of his water. Yeah, if you're traveling uh, in summer, that'd be a problem. Big problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So everything's got to be guarded or protected in some way, shape, or form just because mm-hmm. rocks can fly up. You might think it's only little stones, but, boy, you occasionally get a big rock and those stones are pounding away all the time and they'll just wear it away and snap it off. So you started off at Mari and you obviously ran the track through. In terms of um, – because there's so many places to stop and see and so many little side tracks and detours and things like that. Mm. In terms of taking your van on the Udnadatta track, any considerations with doing these additional sort of offshoots or side trips with the van as well? Well, some of the roads are just – some of the places you can see are just off the road. They're only, you know, a kilometre or two and the road's no different to the Edmundo track. It's just a little dirt track. Um, mm-hmm. Some of them are a lot worse. Uh, if, for example, you want to go out and see Lake Eyre, that's a completely different scenario. That road is extremely rough. Mm-hmm. It goes through a um, private property and even though it's a public access road, as far as I'm concerned, uh, as far as I can see, it's never been maintained. So mm-hmm. the corrugations are like, you know, a metre apart and 200 millimetre deep. They're, they're just all over the road and even on the sides of the road where people try to get off them. So that's a real slow trip. If you've only got, if you're not confident with towing your van out there, if you don't want to, uh, leave it at uh, William Creek. Mm-hmm. Got a really nice campground there, and um, go out in your in your four wheel drive. I wouldn't take a car out there uh, simply because it's really rocky, and the corrugation is just absolutely awful. So that's the Halligan Bay, which is from just south of William Creek, and it's uh, one of the I think it's one of the closest places you can get to Lake Eyre. Um, yeah. I know I did a long time ago, and it's pretty rough. Um, so yeah. yeah, that's that's what because uh, that's. 30, 50 odd k's, isn't it? But it's yeah. not a uh, it's not a half hour to hour drive. It's a no, long yeah, drive it'll there. It'll take you a good hour and a half, I reckon, to yeah. get out there, and, and an it, hour and a half to get back. And if you throw a van on, you're probably extending that time frame <laughs> to, yeah. to try yeah. to tow it out. So yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. William Creek, like you said, it's only a few k's up the road, so leave it there. Um, what about uh, before we go into all the details of all the side trips, the track conditions in general? Um, I know, I've done it a few times, and I've it's I've had it. From everything from being a really smooth road that's quieter than the highway, like all you can like hear freshly is freshly graded, yeah, and like perfect. And all you can hear is the hum of the engine, and the car just glides over the top of this this sort of hardly compacted surface. But then I've been at other times where it was so rough that I'm doing forty k's an hour, trying to find a sweet spot to smooth the bumps out, and the tires are all chipped up, and it's rough as anything. Um, but how did you find it on on this trip? At the moment. This trip I found it pretty good. Um, when you mentioned it was very smooth, I've been on it too, and that's when it's been smooth. And often that's after rain, mm. and you find that the cars that do go on and start to compact the surface down, and it actually becomes very smooth. And you you really do feel like you're on a nice super highway. You can just mm. feel the tires humming, and that's all you hear. Um, but other times it can be quite corrugated and stony. This time I found it wasn't too bad. There are a couple of sections um, just after William Creek where it got a little bit corrugated, a bit rougher. I had to slow down a bit, but overall it wasn't bad. Um, but, yes, it, it's a track that they maintain pretty well. There's a lot of um, big cattle stations up there. There's Urna Dada, William Creek. They all need to be supplied, so they have to have trucks go along them. So they try to keep it in a condition where at least a truck can get along at a reasonable speed, which means it gets graded every now and then. So overall it wasn't a bad road this time. 
I think in general you can assume it changes a lot though, right? I mean, that smooth surface, you have a bit of rain, that's suddenly become, going to become quite slippery and dangerous if you get a little bit oh, of yeah. rain on that smooth surface. And, yeah. uh, you know, after a bit of rain, it suddenly becomes mm. rutted out and, you know, yeah, it can, it can change very quickly. And, oh, yeah, yeah. and like obviously, you know, if you head up there and you want to do the track and the track's closed, if you, you know, you happen to just be up there maybe on part of a longer trip or whatever, you're not specifically planning, it's all very good and well because the road's closed. But what if you're actually on the track mm-hmm. and rain comes? Well, you have to decide what you're going to do. Now, <laughs> we're in this situation. I know, I knew you were going to ask me this. <laughs> on our trip, we just got back. We actually weren't on the Unidad track at the time. We were heading out towards uh, a place called Dalhousie Springs, and we turned off just after the town of Unidad. Mm. And we only got about halfway between the two, and it was getting late in the day. We found this lovely spot beside a cry creek peak, so we camped. That night, it decided to start to rain. Now, the forecast in Unidad said point of a millimetre, so we weren't concerned. We thought we'll go out there. I think they had 10 millimetre in the end. Someone told me when we actually got to our destination. And okay. initially, the road wasn't bad. It was a little bit muddy, but it deteriorated. And, of course, it rained on and off for the rest of the day, and it became a real slippery, slidey thing. And we sort of thought, well, do we go on and do we go back? If we go back, we've got the same. We had really nowhere to stop. We have a caravan, but our friends had a tent and a camper trailer, so it was just mud and stone, so there was nowhere to put that up. So we mm. thought we would just go on slowly. There are a few other cars on the road as well that passed us, and they waved, and they said, yes, it should be okay, you should get okay. We, we did get through all right, but the last 60K took us, well, we are doing about 10 Ks an hour uh, in, okay. the, in the mud, and we had to stop frequently. The clay would clog the wheel arches up, and sometimes I was actually pulling the caravan around with the wheel not going around, so we had to stop and dig the clay out. Oh, wow. So rain was a real big factor in this one. We got through okay, and within the two days that we're out at Dalhousie, came back in, it dried out to a much better surface, and we were able to get out quite easily. Okay. So, I bet you had a nice wash in the hot springs there. That would have been well, oh, well yeah, earned. That was a highlight. <laughs> we're all dying to get to the springs. We just mud and everything. We just got out and jumped in. Just all yeah. in our undies, I think. We yeah. couldn't <laughs> want to get changed. That sounds amazing. <laughs> so I guess that's a classic example of how it can change. We, we haven't touched on different cars that you can do it in, um, but I know someone well, yeah, who's done it in a sedan. Yeah, right. But, I mean, this all comes down to knowing what the track condition is, knowing what the weather conditions are like, and driving to the road conditions as well, right? And like we said before, yeah. the right tyres. So, Because, I mean, mm-hmm. I'd obviously really love to do it, but we've got the sprinter. So it's like a, a – it seems like it's something that would be doable just with a lot of consideration and, and pre-planning and maybe even a buffer because, you know, if you're expecting – if you know you might get a little bit of rain, but in your case, Kev, you're expecting 0.2 of a mils, but you got 9.8 mils more than that. Mm. Just yeah. being able to know that potentially you need to stay where you are for a day or two before you can sensibly – get out, probably having yeah. a bit of flexibility there yeah. would be important. That buff is important. If, yeah. you, if you're yeah. pushing to yeah. be back by a certain date, that's when you're going to end up in, in, in trouble, trouble if the weather does come in. Yeah. So should we ask about some of Kev's favourite spots? Yeah. So you, you went from south to north, so you started at Maree. Is that yes. right? But but the trip up to Maree from South Australia is pretty interesting too, isn't it? Because you've got – there's like Lee Creek. You've got Farina, which is an old – old township there along the railway line. Yes. They, they, they run yes. a bakery there, I think, in the winter yep. months. Um, yep. On the, pa- the Parachilna pub where they do the feral three. Oh, yeah, they get yes. a good meal at yes. Parachilna what is it? pub. It's so. a, what is it? The feral three, what is it? It's um, yeah. camel, 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 crocodile. 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 Amy, you, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we say it starts at Maree, but that trip up through mid-north South Australia is pretty awesome. There's a lot to it, see it's before you nicer. get to Maree. Yeah, we went up through the Clare Valley wine region and then into the Flinders Ranges and it was much prettier. The, the range is just beautiful. And um, even if you bypass, the, don't actually go through the Flinders Ranges, the road that goes around via Lee Creek will take you past them and they're over on the right-hand side. They're just majestic, uh, majestic, mm. majestic mountains. And yeah. as you said, there's Farina with its campground. You can actually camp there. It's a private campground, so you pay as you go in. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've got um, toilets and a little thing called a donkey shower where you light a fire under a billa, boiler and let it go for about an hour or so and then you can have a hot shower. Um, but it's just an interesting place. And, yes, then you get to Maree. That's a pretty interesting place too. It's got some old railway engines there. That's where the line was running through until the 80s sometime, I think early 80s, and then it closed down altogether. Mm. And then as you go along the track, as I said, it follows the old, the original Gann railway line. So there's old railway stations, there's some bridges, there's some water tanks, there's a, a repeater station, 
there's there's a few things to see. Whereas if you compare that road to say the major highway, the Stuart Highway, mm. that's just a transport route. You it's apart from Cooper PD and a couple of roadhouses, there's really nothing on it. Okay, uh, it's just a, a bitumen road. So if you want to get to Alice Springs quickly, yes, that's the way to go. But if you want to go by a scenic route, I would recommend if you can to go by the Uden Data Track. Yeah, Stuart Highway is one of those things. It's nice to do once, but by the time you do it a second or third time, it's it, it's, it's a long it's same. straight drive. Yeah, so yeah, is yeah. Uh, was Tauk Tauk Alf near Murray still? Did you go to see Tauk Alf? Have you heard of Tauk him? Alf? Is yeah. still there? Yeah. I saw some signs from. We didn't go and visit him, okay. but yes, we did go and see some signs. The signs and turn off to his place. Yeah. Okay. So who's Tauk Alf, you guys? Oh, it's, it's like Tauk is a stone in the area, and he just does rock carving. What like so talcum it, powdered type? Yeah, that yeah. sort of thing. So, but you just go up to his house, and it's, it's just all these carvings around, and you can go and buy he's them. an artist. So yeah. He's Man, an artist, there are yeah. some really cool characters out in the Flinders Ranges and Absolutely. SA Outback, yeah, which yeah. I'm sure is relevant to all states, but. Flinders just seems especially special with artistic, creative Unique people just characters. out there. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Uh, Coward Springs, awesome campsite there too, and that's all accessible yep. via just general caravan. You don't, there's no big uh, four-wheel drive track there. That. And yep. a hot, hot nice spring there. There's a desert oak sea you can camp under. It's a lovely spot. And there's also a museum there that gives you a bit of history on the um, on the original Gann Railway line too. Yep. Beautiful. Pub at William yeah. Creek, that's all accessible. Well, your creek's a good yeah. hotel, and you also fly out over Air, uh, Lake Air with uh, there. There's an air airstrip there, and a um, yep. they've got their own office now. A, 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 a airline company of some sort that does the um, flights, so you can go out there. Oh, quite like a, a scenic a, tour, air tour scenic thing. Tour, yeah. yeah, 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 and from Mari too. They do it from Mari as well. And how many days did you spend? Doing it. Well, we didn't actually go through to Marla that way this time. We actually turned off after Udnadatta. Uh, oh, okay. You could easily do the Udnadatta track in two days if you wanted to. Uh, you can do it in one day if you really wanted to. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'd say allow at least three yep. if you're especially going to take the side trips and just have a look at some of the most interesting places. There's some great spots to camp. Yeah, there's Lake Air South. So even if you don't actually get out to Lake Air, Lake Air South is right beside the track. You can pull off and have a look at that. Um, that's oh, yeah. a really big body of water at the moment. Um but, uh, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of little things, but three days would be a good time to do it in. Cool. Awesome. Mm. I'm excited now. I think I'm going to make it happen. Yeah, you're going to tow yeah, a caravan just, with your sprinter? F- no, I won't tow a caravan, but I'll work out a way. <laughs> <laughs> Take the bike. We saw some bike riders out there and also oh, a guy rides. with, his, um, with his, uh, horse and wagon too, horse and cart. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Who do we work? That was um, uh, Harry, Harry Vidal. Harry Vidal. Is, yeah. Mm. yeah, he's done yeah, been up and down. Yeah, couple horses on his uh, gypsy wagon. Yep. And he had that <laughs> little truck to back him up with, yeah. I was yeah. going to say, if I do Uden Dada in my van, I should probably take a disguise. So if something does go terribly wrong, nobody can recognise that Lauren from yep. Snowy's is stuffed yep. Uden Dada <laughs> track trip. Kevin told you. <laughs> You should put proper tyres on your sprinter. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, awesome. (laughs) That was cool, Kev. Hopefully that answers a heap of questions on anyone wanting to do the Unidata track in their caravan, but it sounds just like a bit of preparation, a bit of time, slow and steady and lower your tyre pressures. And, um, yeah, yeah, you should be right. Beautiful. And take it easy. Don't rush it because, uh, as I said, it is a dirt road. There can be around the corner and suddenly there's these horrible corrugations in front of you. Mm. If you're going too fast, you start skipping along the road, you can lose control. So just take it easy and uh, consider the road and uh, just enjoy the ride. It's not a bad ride at all. Beautiful. Awesome. Thanks, Kev. If anybody's got any um, questions as well, don't forget, you can chuck them below if you're watching on YouTube or jump onto our Facebook group and we'll get Kevin to... Answer those, even if you've got a trip coming up really soon on the track and you want to know some relevant right now information, yeah. get the hot tip from just Kevin. Back, just one like, thing I'd like to add. Yeah. Uh, if you are taking a caravan, take two spare wheels. Don't two take just spare one. wheels. Take two spare wheels. Because if you happen to shred a tyre and uh, destroy it, you'll only have one left and you won't have another spare. And, uh, yeah, it's always safer to take two spare wheels. So that's two for the caravan and what, two and for the car, the car. as well? And the car right. as well. I so always, got, on those sort of roads, I always take two. One of each. Spares, one extra right. the car and the All right. I used to oh take no, two. Minimalist Ben is thinking, oh, my God, no, how I, much I, are four spare tyres going to weigh? <laughs> I used to take two, but I'm back to just taking one now. But I buy good quality tyres and I've touched wood. I've not had any issues yet. So. I guess it depends on the kind of trip you're going to do as well, I suppose. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Thanks, Kev. Thanks, Kev. We'll no see worries, you next time cool. for another – Another caravan awesome caravanning episode. Topic. Cool. Well, that was uh, that was cool. Yeah, I learned a bit today. I'm still yeah, not towing a caravan on the Uden Data track. I'm still not doing a caravan anywhere either. Maybe when I'm older. Definitely. <laughs> when I can't be bothered 
setting up a campsite, I'll consider a caravan. Any questions, let us know down below or the Snowy's Camping Show Facebook group. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Catch you next week.